Thank you very much. Thanks to the entire NGS team, to Keon for putting this on. This is a great event, really good idea. I hope that uh, it continues for many, many years. So I might all queued up. All right, I think I'm gonna take a little different angle than I am pretty sure a lot of these speakers have taken in terms of the uh, sharing some of the experience that I've had and advice that I've had. Um, I may touch on some of the best business practices, but I'm gonna focus on the individual the individual is the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur is the founder, the founder is the team builder, and really identify what I think is the secret to success in entrepreneurship, but also in life. And uh, indulge me, I think we've got a small enough group that if you guys want to ask questions while I talk, I'm totally happy to answer them. So let's do that. So in a nutshell, what we do at New Sphere, what I've been doing for about 15 years is building companies. We work with startups, uh, we work with entrepreneurs. They come to us, sometimes they come with an idea, sometimes they come with an existing business. Sometimes we internally at New Spheres will invent the company and develop the management team around the idea. These are some of the companies that we have helped launch. Anybody recognize Phone Halo here? It's a company out of UCSB, which was a great success so far. They've raised a couple million dollars and they're doing really well. I think they've raised a couple million dollars. So, does anybody here know what temet noske means? Raise your hand if you do. It's a Latin phrase. No? Okay, well let's have Neo and the Oracle answer that question. You know what that means? It's Latin. It means know thyself. I'm gonna let you know the secret. So know thyself, know yourself, that's what it means. Why is that so important? Now you just heard Kevin talk about all the, the exciting things that you guys have inherited from past generations and, and the problems and the escalating debt. So in spite of all that, why is knowing yourself such a key thing here? How many people have heard of Bhutan's Gross Happiness Index? Cool, nice. So everybody knows about gross domestic product, right? That's what Kevin was talking about. It's a, it's a measure of society's success. It's a measure of a, of a country's success. It looks at all sorts of economic factors and indicators, and it turns around and says, you know, we're, we're on the right track. We're growing as an economy, we're growing as a country. Well, the country of Bhutan, this tiny, tiny little country, has designed a completely different set of metrics to measure its success as a country. And they call it the Gross Happiness Index. And the idea is that at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how much money you make, how many properties you own, how many businesses you have, how much power you have, if you're not happy. I mean, would anyone disagree with that notion? Why is knowing yourself so fundamental to being happy? Well, before we get into that, let's talk about the consequences of not knowing yourself. And I'll share with you guys a story about capacity. So, what does the word capacity mean? I'll tell you guys, when I was about your age, I started my first business in Michigan. It was called Webly. By the way, I graduated from the University of Michigan, just like Kevin. Just want to point that out. Go blue. And while I was in Michigan in Ann Arbor, I was building this web development agency. We had some pretty large clients like General Motors and Chrysler. And I met this guy at a luncheon, a conference, kind of like where we're at today. Had a great connection with this guy. His name was Tom Foley. He was a very successful entrepreneur, very well-connected guy. He shared with me uh, some insights. I asked a lot of questions. He liked me. We said we were going to do business together. He told me to reach out to him. He gave me his card. And I was excited. He was a very well-connected guy. I thought he was going to open up a lot of doors. And I was really stoked. So the next day, I emailed him. And I said, hey, Tom, can I take you to lunch this coming Monday? And he said, sure, let's do that. So we scheduled a lunch meeting for noon on Monday. And lo and behold, due to my capacity problems, my capacity constraints, Monday came, I had a few meetings in the morning, I had a few things I had to accomplish. I was completely frazzled, overwhelmed. 11 o'clock came, I was still overwhelmed. I was not gonna make that new meeting. So I called Tom, and I said, Tom, you know, I apologize, I, I, I can't make the new meeting. I've got a lot going on here at the office and fires to put out. I hope you can understand, I'd like to be scheduled. He said, no problem, Jack. 
Let's reschedule. I'm, I'm free later this week. How does Friday look for you? Friday works, Tom. I'll be there. I'll pick you up. We'll go have lunch. So, Friday comes in, and uh, I'm you know, keeping my calendar clear in the morning, and I'm, I'm excited for my lunch meeting with Tom, and I leave the office. He's about 30 minutes away, about 30 miles away, and I look at my gas tank, and it gives me the impression that I'm going to make it, and I don't really worry about it because I'm kind of a cocky young entrepreneur and not too worried about capacity issues. And I get in the car and I head up, and 20, 20, 22 miles in, I start to panic that my gas gauge is really low. And I say, I'm going to get off the highway, and I'm going to find a, a gas station, I'll still be on time, everything's cool. But I got off on the wrong road, and I'm just driving. There's a lot of farm country in Michigan, let me tell you. And it's like miles and miles and miles, and next thing you know, I'm out of gas. And I'm sitting on the side of the road at 11.45, my meeting's in 15 minutes, I'm probably five miles away, but I'm out of gas, I'm not going to make the meeting. I call one of my coworkers and I ask them to come pick me up. I call Tom and I, just very apologetic, I say, Tom, you wouldn't believe it. I, I got in my car, I thought I had enough gas to meet you, and I didn't. And I'm, uh, I'm sitting here on the side of the road. I, I, I can be there at 12.30, apologize profusely, and uh, you know, if you prefer to reschedule, let's reschedule. He says to me something I'll never forget. He says, uh, Jacques, I, I don't think so. I don't think I'd like to keep our meeting. And I was like, well, why? You know, we, I was thinking, we have this great connection, and these things happen. This is life. And he said, no, I, I understand, and, and um, please don't take this personally, but if I schedule another meeting with you, there's a 33% chance that it's going to be successful. And I just don't do that, Jacques. I don't schedule meetings where there's a 33% success rate. And I was like, 33%? What is this guy talking about? And he explained it to me. Well, let's, let's see here. We've scheduled three meetings now, and you haven't shown up for two. So if we have a third meeting, and you show up, and we have a really productive time together, it will have been a 33% success rate. That's not good enough. Well, to make this long story very short, we ended up connecting weeks, weeks later. I, I gave it a lot of thought, and he was right. I had a very poor time managing my capacity. I didn't know how long things took me. That's why I was late for that first meeting. I underestimated the distance. I didn't get gas the night before. It was these little things that delayed my ability to connect with this very important entrepreneur. I did not know myself. This was the consequence. And you're going to have a lot of unnecessary conflicts with partners, right? If you don't know your personality, if you don't know what your temperament is, what, how much you can handle in terms of certain personalities, what your patience level is, you're going to get into business with somebody, some people, and you're going to have these conflicts that are going to just drown the business. How many startups have I come across? Brilliant ideas, brilliant people, bad chemistry because they didn't know who they were and how they were going to assemble together and be successful. Many, many. And then you end up living your life fulfilling other people's goals. Now, I did this for the first few years. I mean, my, my definition of success the first few years out of college was, you know, making sure I was impressing my parents. I will see my dad. I mean, that's just no way to live, right? So the reason is because I didn't really know what my passion was. My, my passion was make a lot of money at the time. So I thought, oh, I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to build websites. I'm going to build a company. I'm going to, you know, show off and... You know, I got to like 24, 25, and I was like, well, wait a minute, it's actually my life. I can't be fulfilling other people's goals. So I started really thinking about what my goals were. The worst thing, the worst thing that can happen if, when you don't know yourself is that you're successful. Because you're going to find yourself with so many assets and so much security and so much money, and you just simply will not be happy. So knowing yourself is the secret. And there are some positives, right? You're going to know exactly what role you're going to play in an organization. This is key, right? You're going to come in, you're going to say, no, I cannot be an operator. I am not patient enough. I don't have these skills analytically, but I'm a great hunter. I should probably be in sales. You're going to spend more time playing on your strengths and not your weaknesses. This is something I'm going to talk about later, but boy, if, if you can figure out what your strengths are and just surrender to your strengths and focus in on your strengths, you will be wildly successful and wildly happy. Most people don't do that, by the way. They actually plan on their weaknesses. Incredibly. 
And you're going to surround yourself with the right management team. Right now, if any of you here are looking to start a business or start a one, raise your hand if you have. Management team is more important than the idea. The management team is more important than the business plan. Because the idea is going to change, the market is going to change, the business plan is going to change, but the people are not. The people are the people. So you have to choose very wisely, very carefully. And ultimately, I think you're going to live a more happy life. You're going to be more fulfilled knowing yourself. You're going to feel more confident, more secure. And again, what is more important than that at the end of the day? Well, let's get into it. Everybody here has, uh, is on somewhere on this, uh, this spectrum of being task-oriented or people-oriented. And I want to tell you the difference between the two. And let me emphasize it. These next two slides, there's absolutely no right or wrong. There is simply A or B. Now, task-oriented people, they make lists based on what they know. The people-oriented people, they want to communicate with their team. They want to connect with their team before they make any list, before they start any agenda. The task-oriented people, they take personal action and start getting things done. In fact, if they can knock out three things on that list before the next group meeting, they'll do it. However, the people-oriented people, They'll look at the people in the group first, they'll build consensus, they'll assign the assignments, the tasks based on that. You're going to set deadlines if you're task oriented based on your assessment, what you think things should take, how long you think things should take. If you're people oriented, you're going to ask others before you move forward. Task oriented, you love being in control. I mean, you need to be in control. Again, there's nothing wrong with this. I'm not passing judgment. I'm not telling you to be a better person. I'm telling you to know yourself. I'm not telling you to be yourself, by the way. I'm telling you to know yourself. It's very different. So you like being in control if you're task-oriented. If you're people-oriented, you are a lot more concerned about how the team is feeling at all times, not about how your own individual situation is. You're selfless in that capacity. And you're good with a need-to-know basis type of information sharing as a task manager. But if you're a manager that functions as a people-oriented manager, in a way, you think everybody should know what everybody else is doing. So how many people here are task-oriented? Raise your hand. Raise them high. Come on now. And people-oriented? Okay, now let me tell you how many people here, and by the way, the answer is everybody, is going to be involved in sales at some point in their business. Everybody. Okay. So here's a secret, okay? Because... Figuring out who the task-oriented people are and the people-oriented people are when you walk into a sales call is fundamentally important to your success. I mean, it's going to make or break that sales call, right? So how do you know almost instantly if the person you're talking to is task-oriented or people-oriented? And why do you want to know that? Because if they're task-oriented, you want to talk about the data, the quantitative things. You want to talk about tasks, the job at hand, what needs to be accomplished, how you're going to make the money, what the ROI is. All those kinds of things. That's all they care about. If you're talking to a people-oriented person, they want to connect with you. They may want to talk about their kids. They may want to talk about hanging out, what foods you like. They may want to talk about chemistry within a team. They want to talk, talk about where you're going to be in five years. So the way you can tell is if you look in the office and you walk into this uh, environment, do they have photos of their family anywhere? Do they have images on their walls? How neat and organized is their desk? If it's neat and organized, and there's not a lot of things going on, they're task-oriented. If it's kind of a frazzled situation, they're probably people-oriented. There's more to it, and we'll talk about it later, but it is a secret in sales calls that makes all the difference. Because if they're task-oriented, you go right to the issues at hand. The meeting has to be short, to the point, and focused. Don't waste their time, because they're the ones doing a lot of the thinking, because they're in control of the business. They're people-oriented, they have all the time in the world for you. They want to make eye contact. They want you to ask questions about them. They want you to know them. How about the difference between managers and leaders? Now, some of you here are going to be leaders in your organization, and some of you are going to be managers. It is, there's not, they're equal. They're equal. But there is a difference. And you have to know where you are on this. And, and these are awesome, these comparisons. You'll start to really get it here. The manager takes care of where you are today, right? They make things work today. What does the leader do? They take you to a new place. They're thinking about what's next. The manager deals with complexity. The leader deals with uncertainty. The 
manager's concern about finding facts and the leader's making decisions. The manager cares about doing things right. This is like huge because this is why I'm a leader and not a manager. And the leader is concerned with doing the right thing. I mean, if you put me in charge of a complicated project, it will go wrong. Because I just want to get it done, right? I want to move on to the next thing. I'm not going to sit there and look at all the details, dot all my I's. That's not me. That's not my personality. That's not who I am. But I love to be analyzing the trends that are happening. I love to be looking at the effect of what we're doing, the efficacy of what we're doing, the value proposition of what we're doing. That's why I hire really good managers around me. That's why I surround myself with people who compliment me. Compliment with an E, not an I. The manager finds answers and solutions, and this is a good one, right? Because the leader formulates the questions and identifies the problems. So you've got a meeting, and the leader sitting there, the, the leader's usually the CEO, and they're like, whoa, this, what about this? This could be a huge problem, and what about this? What, should we find out the answer to this? And then the manager's the one who creates the questions for the survey, who does the research to find the answers, who actually produces the substance behind those questions. Very different personality. Now, if you're thinking, hey, Jack, you know, I'm, I'm actually both of these people. You're not. Okay? You're just not. I'm sorry. I mean, you might be able to do both of these things. That would make you quite the entrepreneur. There's also some engineers that are great business people like Kevin. But if you want to have a really successful organization, it takes teamwork, and it takes surrounding yourself with the people that are going to complement you with the things that you don't do very well. And that's why you have to know these things. Well, let's talk about the formula to know yourself, because I, I imagine, I already think all you guys are smart, you know what you're doing, to be here on a weekend, it says a lot. So, you know, you can Google market validation, you can look up GDP versus debt ratio, and you can figure out why one business plan worked, why one did not work, but there's no real formula yet for knowing yourself, and I'm gonna give you a sense of what things work to really figure it out, okay? Okay, so, People recognize this actor, this guy? This, this thing he's holding? How many people have seen Limitless? Pretty much everybody. Okay, so just a real quick synopsis of Limitless, for those of you that haven't. It's this kind of down and out, great guy, but he's just down and out. He's depressed, he's, um, his life is out of order, and he, he comes across this, this pill, this drug. He takes it, <laughs> and lo and behold, everything starts coming together. I mean everything. I mean his love life, his social life, his business life, his artistic side of his life. I mean he starts killing it. Now, you look at this film and you look at the drug and you look at what really the story is telling you and you might think a lot of things. You might think that it's literally doing something in the brain and it's causing these synapses to fire that couldn't otherwise fire. But what I think the drug really does that you all can do is it causes you to be present. Right? This guy had an incredible talent of observation when he was on that drug. He noticed everything. Just like I am noticing everything right now. Because I am so consumed with this moment. Because that's all that's happening right now. Yes, I know. I know there are texts you need to respond to. I got it. There was a disagreement this morning. Oh, that's cool, right? No, I know. And tonight, you're looking forward to that. All right. But right now, the only thing that's really happening is my voice the pressure against the seat, against your bodies, and that's it. All these things going off right now, they're fabrications, right? Now, how do you get present? Indulge me. Everybody stand up. Stand up. And we're going to do this three times. We're going to take a deep, deep breath all together, and on our exhale, we're going to outburst with laughter. Ready? Thanks for getting present with me. What if life was always like that? You know, I'm not saying you're always laughing, meetings and stuff, things might go wrong if you're doing that, but what if life was always that focused? Now that was only four or five seconds, right? 
But what if it was always like that? You gotta practice synchronicity, huh? I'll tell you what synchronicity is not. My favorite band, The Police, this was their last album, it was called Synchronicity. That's how I first learned about this word. Really good album, you guys should check it out. Every Breath You Take, probably heard about that song. It also means a meaningful coincidence, but as far as the entrepreneurship definition, it's, huh, it's weird. It's when your thoughts, your words, and your actions are all, all aligned. Your thoughts, your words, and your actions. And this goes back to capacity, right? You know, I, I trust everybody at the beginning, right? I always trust somebody. If I'm in a meeting with somebody and they say they're gonna do something, I just assume they're gonna do it. But if they don't do it, my brain is taking a little bit of an accounting. It's like, oh, okay, so he, he said something that didn't happen. Okay, well, that's life. Sometimes that's life. But what's the percentage of that happening? 70%? 80? 90? Not a lot of synchronicity if it's that high, right? So you want to get to a point where everything you say is a reflection on what you're really thinking. So that's kind of being honest and transparent. And then everything you do is a reflection of what you said. And that's follow through. And notice when you're thinking certain things and not saying them. And notice when you're saying something and not doing it. Now that's going to tell you a lot about yourself. It's going to teach you tons. Surround yourself. Surround yourself. Now, we all have friends, we all have family, and we all are insecure creatures to a certain extent, so we love to be praised, we love to be supported. This is key, right? But we have to learn to love to be criticized. We have to learn to love to be in a confrontation. A confrontation is not necessarily a bad thing. In business, it is not a bad thing. Again, I'm not going to name names or companies, but I've worked with startups where there are confrontations in boardrooms, right? There are disagreements, there are challenges, and everyone shuts down. And I'm looking at these guys like, and girls, wait a minute, this is not unhealthy, right? This is, this is good. We need to be saying what we're thinking. We need to put this on the table. We can't let this fester. We care about this business, right? We're all in this together, right? So you've got to surround yourself with people that you think are going to be very honest with you and direct and vice versa. I thought this was kind of a nice little thing. Being honest may not get you a lot of friends, but it'll always get you the right ones. So you've got to ask yourself, what's the priority? Is it the quantity of friendships, the quantity of relationships, the quantity of connections, or the quality? And how do you get higher quality? How about trying and failing and trying again and reflecting on that? Michael Jordan says, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career, lost 300 games 26 times. Uh, he's been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed many, many times, no, 26 times. And he's failed over and over again in his life, and that's why he succeeds. I mean, this is arguably, I know, all about LeBron James, arguably, the greatest basketball player of all time, saying that his success is rooted in failure. So this has to be part of your plan. This has to be an iterative part of your personal agenda to fail, and then to learn from the failure, to reflect on it, and then to try again, and probably to fail again. And you cannot have a fear about this, or I advise you to not go into entrepreneurship. I advise you to work for someone else where there is security in terms of a salary, where you don't have to make any sort of risky decisions, and the failure is ultimately not going to be yours, it's going to be the company's. But here's a little secret, right? If you're part of a really cool company and it fails, you will fail too. So you might as well be one of the owners. Reflect on your day. I love this. Um, I, I spend, I try to spend a couple minutes, this doesn't take long, it doesn't take long, it's not annoying. I try to spend a couple minutes at the end of my day and I think about three one-on-one -on -one interactions that I had in that day. And when I reflect on it in my mind's eye, I actually look at the moment, at the exchange, as you would see a film, as I would see in a movie. What was I like? You know, what, what, you know, what was my body language like? What was my voice like? Did I do all the talking? 
Did I wait to listen to their answer when I asked a question? You know, how present was I? So I ask myself these questions, and I, I do it three times. I look at three or two, three a day, and I think about it. And, and I'm going to tell you, sometimes I think I've been, geez, you know, you were a real jackass in that conversation. You know, why were you like that? And, oh, I, I, I think I know why. Because, you know, the last time you talked to this person, they didn't make you feel very good, so you wanted to sort of stand your ground or, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. The point is, that analysis, that self-reflection, It'll, you'll figure things out. You'll, you'll know where you stand, what you're going to work well with, what you're not going to work well with. These are not obvious things, right? These are not taught in any college courses that I know of on planet Earth. These are things you guys have to do on your own. You have to practice it. And check in throughout the day, despite what anybody says, it's absolutely okay to talk to yourself. Okay? Not insane. In fact, I think the people who don't talk to themselves are the ones we should be concerned about. And I mentioned this earlier, playing to your strengths. Keep track of what, you know, what you're good at. I mean, we all know what we're pretty good at, right? And, and think about how much of the day you spend on it, and you'd be surprised. The time that you're spending on things that you're good at is actually really low at the beginning. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that surprising? The, the time you spend doing stuff that you're good at, that you're great at, that you love, is actually pretty, pretty low. That's a small amount of time of your day that you spend doing that. How shocking is that? And then as you continue to notice it and practice it, the percentage goes up. You've got to keep track of it on your own. So I'm not going to... So what I've described to you in the last 20 minutes or so, and this is getting into the third act, final act, is that we're developing a company to solve this problem at New Spirit. It's called, I'll tell you what it's called, it's called Self Echo. And the problem is that people don't really know themselves and, and they don't live really happy lives and they don't really have a sense of what's going on. So the premise is really simple, right? I think of the human being as principally hardware and software. You know, hardware, software. And we go to college to download and to develop our software. Imagine when the days of the matrix become reality and we can download how to fly a helicopter or all four years of your education will just be instantly available to you. That's, a, that's really around the corner, by the way. That's really around the corner. And then the question you should be asking yourself is, well, what's next? And if you want to know, I'll tell you after the talk. I, I have an idea. But I'm, I'm going to say that, you know, we're not that different than a website. Now, for a website, you can look at a website's analytics and you should if you're responsible for a website or a mobile app. And you can analyze every little detail imaginable. You can find out the entry points into the website, home page, about us page, how much time they spend, the navigation patterns for the website, the origination point where they actually got to your website. Did they just type in the URL, the domain name directly in the browser or did they link it from somewhere else? Um, what country they're in, what computer they're using, uh, what browser you're using, a whole bunch of environment variables are being tracked and you can analyze and cross-reference it and learn from it and segment it and really make some decisions, adjust your marketing plan. Why couldn't you do that with the human body and the brain? So here's the amount of data we're creating every day, right? Think about this for a second. We average 34 emails that we send a day and 106 we receive. Uh, we're using our phones 245 minutes a day for calls, Facebook, Twitter, and other apps. 245 minutes a day? Really? It's a lot. Seven different physical locations is how we average. That's how, seven different locations on average is where we go per day. So right now we're on one physical location, right? And we send about 88 texts a day. What if we collected all this data and quantified all of it against the weather, your pulse, even your mood. So, you know, you think of a, of a human being and, and you start to think about all the things that the human being does in an average day from social media posts to texts to emails to moments that they spend at their house, at work, at the gym, to their heart rate during the entire time, to how they're sleeping. And really, it's, it's all data. It's all quantifiable. And there's a movement called the Quantified Self that's trying to do this, that's moving along. It's been around since the 1980s, but it only has gotten really interesting in the last four years. Why? Because of smartphones. 
Smartphones can actually track all of this in real time. Now, there's these little devices called uh, like the Fitbit. Uh, have you guys anybody heard of the Fitbit? Okay, some genius engineers have heard it. Okay, so the Fitbit is this thing you put in your pocket or you clip to your belt and then you, you put it on your wrist at night and it, it tracks a lot of stuff. It tracks like your steps you've taken, where you've gone. Um, it gives you a little diary of yourself. This is, this is a movement that I guarantee is going to be giant in the next 10 years. Just giant. And so that's why we're developing a company looking at this stuff. It's called Self Echo. It's an integrated software platform that analyzes your data input and output, activities, geographical locations, mood, and environment to provide self-analytics, quantification, and assessment. And yes, PowerPoint works. We are currently hiring interns. You can email us later. Okay, so one last thought I want to leave you before we uh, take questions is this. Does anybody here know at what point in terms of your income, your happiness, and your well-being stalls? What, what salary point? I think it's a 70 or 80 grand. That's exactly right, $70,000. Let me explain what I, what I mean by that. There's been studies and analysis done for decades on this, okay? And they're saying, according to today's standards, the four is less money, but at $70,000, if you make $100,000, your happiness goes up a little. If you're making two fifty, dollars your happiness goes up a little but less. If you make a million, your happiness goes up a fraction. So what I'm trying to tell you, all of you here are going to make $70,000 a year. I have no doubts. If you want to, you'll make seventy dollars Work at something you love, work hard, be disciplined you'll make $70,000. I'm guaranteeing this today. I'm not guaranteeing that everyone's gonna be happy though. And that's why knowing yourself is so fundamentally important, not just in the applications for business, but also for yourself, for your life. So I thank you very much for your time. So, am I taking questions right now? Do we have time for questions? One or two. Okay. Yes. What's your idea? What's my idea? Yeah, the next thing. So, self echo? Oh, okay, yeah. So, I'll try to give you a really quick answer, okay? So, what I think is going to happen in the next 20 years is there's going to be a tremendous breakthrough in automation. And what I mean by automation is that the things that the human being has to currently do, and let me give you some examples. Pick up the kids from school. Go to the grocery store and grab milk and eggs and whatever else you need. All of these things are going to be automated by the technology of smartphones and smart shelves and smart pantries and self-driving cars, which Google has clocked a couple hundred thousand miles in this region of Santa Barbara County alone in the last couple of years. All of this is going to be automated. So what's going to happen to the human being? Right? The human being is not going to have to spend any time on these mundane tasks. So where is the energy going to go? What's going to happen? And I think that it's going to cause us to increase our level of shared consciousness without technology. It's going to cause the new sphere, which is a paleontologist concept. A guy named Teilhard de Chardin came up with it. And it's going to cause all of this to be so connected without the technology that we're going to start to work on things that we don't have time to work on right now. Concepts of joy, quality, love. These are going to be the new things. These are going to be the new definitions of the individual in the next 20 to 30 years. Because technology is going to take care of everything else. All the mundane stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. It's a great question. So the question is, once you start figuring out your strengths, whether you're task-oriented or people-oriented, whether you're a manager or a leader, how does that actually filter into a job that you want to have? Well, it goes back to that trying concept. You've got to start trying things. I mean, if you know that you're a people-oriented person, and, and you know that you're, you're probably going to be more of a manager than a leader, then it already segments you. It already filters you down to 
and a, a, a big chunk of things. The next thing you got to start deciding is, do you want to work in, you know, technology? Do you want to work on environment, uh, environmental applications? Do you want to uh, solve political problems? You know, th those are the that's the trial and error. You know, that's what you should be spending your twenties doing, really. But most people don't do that, right? Most people go actually into the area of interest and they struggle because horizontally they're spending all their time figuring out what role they want to play in an organization and what they're really good at, and they come out the other end at 30 kind of stuck, sometimes in the completely wrong discipline. One more question? All right, well, thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of the conference.